Welcome to Season 2 of Reckless, the podcast making you smarter and more knowledgeable about the field of parks and recreation. Join hosts Shane Mize, Jay Tryon, and Tom Venero, three career-long friends from around the country as they dive into the world of parks and recreation with a surprise guest each episode. Laughs, leadership, life, this is Reckless. Hello, hello, and welcome to Reckless. This is our sixth episode of season two, 28th total. I keep forgetting before every show, so I got Shane to keep me on track. I am Tom Venero, joined as always by Shane Mize and Jay Treon as we... Treon. Look, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna say, I don't know who that is, but I'm here. <laughs> new job, new name. So we are here today, Jay Tryon, trying to bring you a little bit inside of our world of parks and recreation. And I got a really special guest for us today. I'm very excited about that. How are you two guys doing today? Doing good. Excited to be I'm here. Good. So happy we to be here. We missed a week. It's good to be back. I, I was going to say, it's it feels like it's been a lot longer than it has, even though it hasn't been that long, but it's it's weird not having a week of talking to you guys face to face. Yeah, yeah. Shane and I were talking just a little while ago about how this this time of year, maybe we neglect how busy it is with the planning piece in addition to whatever else we have going on. So it is nice to be back here with the both of you and our guest on a Friday. To start off today, I'd like to ask you a quick question, and it's in regards to leadership. So you're all in leadership positions. You've all been in different leadership positions. And so I want to know just from your perspective, what quality or maybe a couple qualities or techniques do you use to motivate your teams and create what you feel is a successful workplace environment? Love it. I could talk about this all day. Yo, go I knew you could. Yeah, yes, go sir. for it. Um, you know, I think I got a couple like philosophies that I've always followed when it comes to leadership. And one of them is really all about doing tasks and giving your staff tasks that like you will do and you already do. So like, I've never told my staff to do something that I won't do or I haven't done or don't do alongside them. So, you know, if we're at a special event and this is kind of like that serving by doing and, and showing, but you know, if I'm at a special event, I'm never going to tell staff to go pick up trash if I'm not picking up trash myself. So just kind of leading by example. Um, and I think building relationships outside of work and just knowing you know, get to know your staff and, and know, you know, what brings them joy. I know we've talked a couple of times throughout this podcast about the, uh, the, the six geniuses mm -hmm. and, you know, that kind of leads to it. It's just like what brings you joy, but not just inside of work, but outside of work. So you have those conversations, uh, you know, how was your weekend? Maybe it's about your kid's sports tournament, or maybe you went on a vacation, just getting to know them. And, you know, the more you can build a relationship with your staff, um, the more that you can build trust and honesty and respect. And that just goes to leadership and, you know, they're going to respect you and really want to work for you and hopefully, you know, thrive to be a strong leader within each other of them leading you. And then you growing a leader within them. But then the other side of it is giving them examples to grow and, you know, giving them the ability to make decisions. I think that's been like one area that I've always tried to focus in is like, listen, I don't know all the answers, you're putting this in this position to lead a team. And obviously, hopefully all those team members have a strength and have a foundation of areas that you may or may not know and let them run with their strengths and give them the ability to make decisions. Because, you know, if it's just you making the decision, then what's the point of having all your staff do all the work they're doing? Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff, Jay. It's probably going to leave a lot or a little bit for us to comment, but I know Shane has so many different styles so I'm, I'm very interested to hear a little bit from what Shane has to say yeah I think over the years um I think you grow as a leader um what what I have found very interesting in my path and others is I think you get better or worse at something obviously in in that growth time I don't I don't know if I've developed new leadership skills I've just become authentic in my leadership style and I've become more comfortable in it. I know I'm an interesting bird. Sometimes I know that, you know, we've talked about this. I, I don't like crowds. I don't like people. I'm fairly introverted. I'm a bit of a grinder. If y'all call me tonight at seven or eight o'clock, I'll be in the office. And, uh, and that at times hasn't been great for my 
you know, mental health and other things. And we've all talked about why we do this episode or these podcasts to help, you know, but um, I authentically leadership style, know my profile, know that I'm a grinder, know that I am someone that even from my background in coaching before I came over to Parks and Rec, uh, will really grind on people uh, to make sure we hit the mark on things. And so I, I kind of try to round out my leadership profile too. I try to make sure I don't do a great job of celebrating successes. So I make sure I bring people under my wing that do a great job of celebrating successes that can offset my weaknesses. And so then I'm not trying to be less of what I'm really good at. I'm trying to allow someone else to excel at what they're really good at. Working Genius has helped a lot with that. Daniel Pink's book, Drive, and Simon Sinek's book, uh, uh, why know your why were really formidable for me as a young leader. Uh, they really spoke to me in ways other books didn't. And I do agree with Jay. I give a great deal of autonomy. I give a great deal of accountability. And I know that, you know, Tom and I have talked about how I let people go and how I coach people out of positions and how we have hard conversations, but I, I have a high level of expectation for staff. I don't, I'm not a jovial dude. It's not someone I, you know, I don't go to theme parks and I don't go fishing and golfing and do those types of things that other people find for joy and happiness. Like I get a lot of joy out of seeing someone at an 80% mark, move to an 82% mark or move to an 85% mark. The, the, the growth that they see, I get a lot of joy out of that. And so knowing my leadership profile, knowing that I can be someone that uh, can have a high level of standards and can be pretty grinding, but in a lot of ways, I set the expectations and then I also really work for them. If they need more support, if they need more budget, if they need more of whatever to get to the goal I'm expecting out of them, it's my job to find it, whether it's funding or extra staff or, you know, a weekend off here or there. So I, I really do in a lot of ways work for my staff, but I have a high level expectation and, and that's sometimes tough on staff. And I have over the years come to be okay with, um, that level of standard. I don't, I don't shy away from it anymore. I don't think that because I expect a lot out of my staff, I'm a bad person. And I also don't think people that hit, don't hit my mark are bad people. They just really aren't set to work under my leadership profile. So, so what I'm hearing is, it's just a lot of great themes and I've been to enough conferences or delivered a few sessions myself about, you know, management leadership and, stepping into a director's role. And so some of the themes you just covered were setting the example. And so one one example I use is the the Walt Disney model, right? And Jay, you said it perfectly. He would pick up trash around the park. And, and that's a, a gentleman who built this empire and he could be seen doing that, right? So everybody is expected to do and, and live up to those standards. Empowering your team, encouraging growth, Work, Shane, you mentioned working for your staff, equipping them with what they need to get the job done if they don't have it. Uh, knowing your team, building relationships. I love that one, Jay. That's a, That's been a big part of what, what I believe I've been able to accomplish in working with people. And for me, Shane, I feel like you you threw out a dig about the theme park. So if, if uh, you're not- I didn't not a say Disney. Park, you didn't, but I could tell you that when I meet someone who's a, a big Disney person like myself, we have some great conversations. And then I make it a point to have those conversations almost every time I see them. It's a sure. great way to build that relationship. And it's not just Disney. You could find something else, right? But to your credit, like we're opening a rec center and I know that rec center has to be, I mean, if if I'm a pirate ship type of captain, I know that rec center has got to be a Disney cruise line type of building. And so I've hired people and y'all have got to meet them, Jonathan and others that, are in that mindset and love that type of uh, customer service level and love that type of jovial atmosphere. And I'm all in on supporting them and making sure those initiatives do come off in that way. And so I, I'm not one of those and uh, I'd never work at Disney. I'd never go to Disney. Um, I don't get it, but I don't begrudge the people that do get it. I think there's mm -hmm. a world for those people. And I, I have to make sure we're offering those opportunities as well. So I'm I'm making a statement right now. Put your mask to your ears down. That's all I'm saying. On Take March 8th, that next year when we're all in Orlando. Yeah, you'll be there. Me, you, uh, three of us are going to Disney and we're going to get Shane just rolling through it, man. It's what gonna are be, we going to do? We're, first we're gonna of do, all, we're gonna, 
buy we're overpriced food. I'm not going to ride any Disney. rides. Nope, nope. We're going to do a podcast during in Disney, and then what we'll a hellscape there. Disney oh, sounds like wow. to me. To be quite honest, I mean, Jay, overpriced, just... jam packed with people, and everyone's fucking happy. I don't want to be there. <laughs> Jay, you just made a, a goal of mine. You just created a goal for me, a podcast in Disney. It's it's going to happen. Shane, we're going to get you to wear some ears. Oh, yes. Maybe, we right. might have to actually record this one and show the video of him wearing ears the whole time. Oh, Ridiculous. yeah. There's no way. Well, I, I appreciate how you look at it, Shane, regardless of that. And, and then just transitioning to knowing yourself trusting what skills you bring to the table and trying to surround yourself with with people who might offset those skills with something that you may not feel as strong or comfortable with and being authentic the only thing i would add to that so you know i, I put a list together assuming you would talk a lot about the common themes that that i've worked through and for me flexibility and i believe that ties in a lot to what all of you have said in all of those topics but <laughs> being understanding of where people are coming from so that ultimately their understanding of what you're asking of them and so, so having a little flexibility along the way to, um, to really just allow them to also be their authentic selves in order to get the job done. So I appreciate you indulging me. I really enjoy that topic and hearing, I learned from you too on a regular basis. And, uh, I've, I've also learned from our guests. So let's jump into it. I'm real excited about our guest today. So to try to put you on the trail. I will start off with letting you know that we all know this guest and we have all known this guest for almost 15 years. Ooh, okay. A uh, white panner? Is this, are you giving the intro or am I giving I'm just intro? asking. I'm just asking. <laughs> right, well, that's, that's not how this works. <laughs> all right. So this individual has worked for two of the largest agencies in the country. The individual's father was a Paralympic athlete in 92 in Barcelona. Jay has got a face that he knows. That's He's not a great right face. Track. We screenshot that face. <laughs> we did screenshot that. So. <laughs> All right. This individual has started the first recreation lacrosse program in one of the biggest lacrosse states in the country, in Maryland. Some of you will know this individual from a phrase that they have coined. I'm actually not going to say it because I think that's going to give it away. We'll get to that. Yes, it does, Shane, go back to our original YPN days. I am so angry right now. We have a, I know you are, we have a co-founder you know of, yes, I do. I think I do. And I've gotten so many stories. This individual roomed with one J Treon. Treon, man, I can't even say your name. This Another individual reason roomed with, a, with Jay at their first NRPA conference in Baltimore, as I understand it. Is that, is that accurate? Did I get that? Or you, you were at least, you went to the same conference together. So co-founder of their own clothing line, a former, a fellow former Robert W. Crawford Award winner and a very optimistic sports fan, as their name would suggest, being a Carolina Panthers football fan. No, I've known from the no second, I, I think I know oh, who it is. Yeah. I've known from the second you started. And for the record, this is my guest next week. That's Get why I'm angry. out of here. Awesome 100%. sauce. This is my guest next week. So I got to find a new guest. You get you you're uh you got an Atuya sized hole in your uh schedule. <laughs> I do. <laughs> All right, we got it. Welcome to the show, Atuya. <laughs> Gentlemen, <laughs> what's up, Jay? I uh, Jay, I feel so bad about this. No, don't. That's Wait, the game. Uh, <laughs> That's the game, <laughs> brother. You got. I want to know who, re who reached out to you first. Did you book with me first, or Tom, oh, or did you no, even Tom forget you booked with me? All eight schedules a year in advance. Tom did it. Tom was on point. Tom was on point. So I have okay, to give Shane. him that. Okay. I have to give him that. But I, want, I do have to say this, Shane. I'm looking forward to getting my big man's hug with you. Yes, sir. But you having the Mickey Mouse ears on. <laughs> oh, no. It's the only thing that can make our hug even <laughs> no. better. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. I'm going to get sick that day. <laughs> I'm get sick that day. So welcome to you, Cornwell, Chapel Appreciate Hill it. Parks and Recreation Director. Thank right. you for making the time. Welcome. I may have been on point with gathering the guests. I still can't say my own co-host names. Don't but, worry about it. You know, it's it's uh, it's been a long day or week or a couple of weeks, whatever you want to call it. That's so great. you know, let's let's jump before we jump in. Can I? I think I made a mistake in interpretation. You so you both attended Baltimore together. That's correct, right? That was your first 
Congress. You had it right. No, okay. you had it all right. right. Okay, all right. Jay, Jay might not me. remember this, but we were roommates. <laughs> you don't remember that, Jay? No, but I, I thought I drinking. was with Chris. I thought I was with Chris <laughs> Matthews in my first conference. No. Well, let me say this. Baltimore was the conference that we went to. Yeah. Uh, I re had received a fellowship, and you also had one. You were selected from our department in Mecklenburg. Correct, and, yes. And we were two young professionals going for Mecklenburg, mm. and we roomed together, man. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> Atui and I go way back. We worked together in Mecklenburg County uh, back 2006, 2007, 2008, um, so very long time ago. And uh, it's been a tremendous honor to see his career grow throughout the years and talk to him and stay in touch with him. Absolutely. Love it. Program committee member, former. 100%. Yeah, those good things on the program committee. Absolutely. A lot of connections here. And and I want to get started with staying a little bit on theme of our first question. So mm -hmm. I, I mentioned something in the intro. I, I kind of just threw out there awesome sauce. And I didn't want to give it away because I, mm -hmm. I figured maybe Shane and Jay <laughs> knew that. So. Atu, you're a, you're a really great presenter. You're a proponent of personal and professional development, and you've coined this session in this term, awesome sauce. Um, I, first of all, I love all kinds of sauces on all kinds of food. So <laughs> I could relate. He, he oversauces yes, things. I, I may. At times, that would be his catchphrase, right? oversauce. 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 So, oversauce. So in general, I could relate. And the concept, as as you know, I understand it, is basically you're, you're identifying some ingredients that you bring to the table, the best ingredients that make up your awesome sauce, and you're sharing that with your world, whatever that environment is around you. So absolutely, if you can maybe kick us off here, elaborate on the concept of awesome sauce, your inspiration for it, and you know maybe how our listeners could could utilize that in their day to day. If this doesn't yeah, start absolutely. out with when I met Shane Mize, I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> when I met Shane Mize, my awesomeness <laughs> is elevated, right? Oh. Uh, but appreciate it, Tom. And once again, it's a pleasure to be on. I really, really thank y'all. And uh, whenever we have opportunity to connect, um, even if it's just a few minutes, like I get so energized and inspired. And I appreciate y'all, you know, for this y'all input in my career development and it's being able to build with y'all over the years, man. So it's been wonderful. So awesome sauce, like, and it goes back to the program uh, committee day. So, you know, I had my opportunity with NRPA to serve on the program committee. And then after my tenure was over, I was like, okay, I've been sitting on this program committee, getting to read all these great sessions and knowing the process. So I was like, and for me too, you know, I was gonna share, I'm naturally an introvert, but I was like, I'm gonna put in a session. And fortunately I was in Prince George's County and in Maryland at that time. And I had met a, a gentleman um, a good friend, um, come to get good friends, and he's in youth development. His name is Courtney Grange. So we thought about this concept of, you know, putting in a session, and he wasn't a park and rec person, you know, so I always thought that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. On a programming session, bring somebody outside, right? right. Uh, so that was cool. So, and he had did this concept similar to, to Awesome Sauce with um, educators, right? Those that work with youth. And so we looked at it, we organized it and kind of tailored it a little bit towards park and recreation professionals. And really the concept about Awesome Sauce is really what makes you, what makes you special? What makes you unique, right? And going through that process and as you talk about your favorite sauce, Shout out to Polynesian sauce from Chick Fil A. Um, <laughs> shout out to yeah, shout out to uh, Brian Furman. We went to high school together, and he has his own barbecue, and he's down in Georgia. Um, so shout out to his sauce as well. But um, when you think about those po awesome possibility, uh, here, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Do it. Uh, Come on, Brian, hit us up. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But um, when you think about those, you know. When you think about your favorite sauce, it really inspires and you think about, man, what are those ingredients that make you who you are? So, you know, when we have the opportunity to have this engagement, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was down in Georgia, um, Georgia Recreation Park Association, shout out to them for their Women's Leadership Summit. And it was phenomenal. Like they had a really, we had a great time. Like, um, but when you take that time to really evaluate what makes you unique, what makes you special, I think it also is super important how it impacts as you build your ecosystem and build your network. Um, and for me, I think I share it with Tom, like, you know, I think I had a period in my career where me being a little bit of an introvert and those not knowing that I was an introvert at times was kind of having some um, maybe negative results. Like, for example, there was an opportunity that came along. And at the time, my supervisor, I guess they didn't think I was excited about the opportunity. And I was. But as an introvert, often, you know, we digest, we process. I was super excited about the opportunity. He didn't think I was. And she actually had pulled the opportunity away. And so, mm. you know, 
uh, I don't think he, you know, he doesn't want to be involved in that that side of it type of stuff, right? Um, so I think it once again, it also goes back to making sure that you take the responsibility, right, of making sure you're your biggest advocate. And being your biggest advocate is really knowing who you are, that self-actualization, and knowing what you bring to the table, and then also sharing that, pouring on that sauce, right? And then allowing that to be able to help be your ecosystem. And then the conversation y'all had in the beginning, you know, I think it's another great piece of, you know, when you really are getting out there, for me, being able to go out and see my team members in action, I get to see their sauce, right? Mm-hmm. Um just last week, I went out to our, our adaptive recreation family fun night. Um, it was Dr. Seuss's birthday. So I got to get my color on and mm-hmm. get in the head and take my photos and, and all the fun stuff. But for me, being able to see my team members in action, I get to see how awesome they are and what they bring to the table. And then, you know, when we have those conversations in the positions that we're in now, when it's uh, working with our town manager, working with our elected officials, advocating for budget resources and so forth, you know, I can tell that story genuinely tell that story about the impact that our department is making um because i'm being able to see that sauce that people turn on man so that's your awesome sauce yeah i love that because i think it leads into what we were what we were talking about a little bit and it's not talked about enough in our industry is authenticness right being authentic Mm -hmm. there's a reason i got selected as the director of this department and i've been very honest i was the second candidate and you know i have felt over the years that You know, if that was ever redone today, I'd be the first candidate, but I had to step in and I could not try to lead like the gentleman they first offered the job to. I couldn't lead like the gentleman we were replacing. I couldn't lead like, uh, you know, um, a Maxwell book was telling me to lead. You know, everything (laughs) I was doing was, you know, you're taking from it, you're trying to build, but it's very important, I think, and and we've talked about this on the podcast too. I can't try to be Chris Noons because I'll get three steps down that path. And right. then find myself in a spot where I don't know what to do. And if I called Chris, he wouldn't know what to tell me because I was imitating him, not being him. So I, I wouldn't even take the path he took. I would took the path I thought he was going to take. And so he can't even help me out if I'm even trying to imitate him. It's the best way to do it is to be yourself. There are very few people in our industry that, that are more unique and authentic, I think, than Atuya. The, the, the clothing line, for example. I mean, just... Sure. You got to meet my park superintendent, Junior. We we took a photo Correct. together. Mm-hmm. And uh Junior, we we talked, I don't know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. You know, I got Junior got it was got to go to Dallas and meet it to you. We walked away and Junior's like, that's a cool dude. And he didn't have that interaction, his first NRP with everybody else. But but you can tell your authentic nature through your conversations. How do you feel comfortable being that person that that is just saying, okay, I may be the only person that has this idea of being a clothing designer and, and mm-hmm. maybe what people perceive of someone that designs clothes versus being, or wears a really colorful outfit. Like you were talking about at Dr. Seuss night, how do right. you feel comfortable <laughs> being you? Because we've all grown up in this industry and it's, mm-hmm. it's really cool to see you land as a director, but we all battle the insecurities of, am I right for this role? Am I being too much of myself to get this role? You know, and and when do you come out of your, you know, cocoon and become, hey, this is who I am. This is who I'm going to be. And this is what the department needs. I know the department needs me to be authentically me so I can serve authentically. Where where do you find comfort in that? How do you find your your strength in that? Yeah, absolutely. And and as y'all know, often, man, my father is my hero. Um, as you heard earlier, he was a Paralympic athlete, uh, power lifter uh, in competition, got up to about 475 out of world records, um, national records. Um, so my pops, man, really, and I often in my Awesome Sauce presentation, I share that my inspiration of knowing about being your authentic, you know, authentic self um, from my pops and the impact that it can make. And like, I never really... And I really kind of lean in this probably the last several years, like really realizing that um, being in this, you know, opportunity to be a public servant, I've really always just wanted to be able to make an impact at least on one or two people like my pops has made on hundreds of people. And growing up, man, I really saw it in action. I shared a story. Um, I was like 12 years old. We were in Seattle, Washington. It was the National Veteran Wheelchair Games. And my pops, man, he had just finished, won another gold medal, right? And we're sitting over one of his other friends, and we're just standing, waiting to go somewhere. 
and this other athlete rolls up to him. Um, and as he was rolling up to my pops, you know, could always tell this dude got tears in his eyes. Right. And he asked my dad, he was like, you know, are you Cater Cornwell? And my, my dad said, yeah, I'm Cater Cornwell. And all he could get out, um, this in his emotion, he was like, you got me here. Mm. He said, you got me here. And then he had to roll, he rolled to the restroom to get himself together. A guy that was with him said, basically shared with my dad, man, that that guy had just within that year had became, you know, paralyzed. And he had saw my pops. Cause like my pops, man, back in the day, man, he was like, you know, uh, the Michael Jordan, the wheelchair mm. sports, right? You know, people would camp out to see him get ready, whatever bench he was going to bench on, because he was the heavyweight, right? And he had you no know, commercials. Um, he was in Jet Magazine, had been featured on ESPN, stuff like that. So the guy saw my dad's story, and it helped him get to those games. Like, he wanted to be there, man. So just to see that impact, and between my pops and my mom, just them as a unit, uh, how they've been able to do it over their lifetime, Um it really motivated me. And that time when I was 12 years old, that really changed my life, man. And here's the thing. My pops is always so authentic. And he's been in so many settings, man. My dad was on the White House line when they signed the American Disabilities Act, right? Wow. So he not only did the sports side, but he was also, you know, people say like LeBron, more than an athlete. My pops was that, you know, advocating for people with disabilities, advocating for veterans to make sure they get their benefits and so forth. So he's been in so many settings. He's been in settings like I used to go with him on Capitol Hill, man. You know, meeting with he would meet with House of Representatives, senators and stuff like that. But the coolest thing about my dad was, um, you know, I mean, let's keep it real. You know, sometimes you have people and they could be in a certain room and a certain title comes into that room and they'll stop talking to you mm-hmm. to talk to that title. Mm-hmm. That's not my pops, man. Like my pops was always and, and him and my mom, like, you know, um, genuine. And, you know, I don't I'm. Like I've been, I've seen him with, uh, we were in London and, you know, I got to meet Prince Charles coming to meet the athletes. Um, you know, he met, uh, back in the day, uh, marvelous Marvin Hagler, you know, yeah. shout out to the new England area. Right. Um, just several names, but what I'm saying is that those people could come into the room or his space, but he's still going to finish that conversation and he's going to bring that other person that he was talking to to meet that maybe higher celebrity person or personality. Um, so just that genuineness comes from that and knowing that when you are your genuine self, the impact that you can make, man. And, um, you know, this week for me personally has been phenomenal because I've had two people that I'm a consider, you know, I've, I've been a mentor to and they've had some cool things happen to them this week and they reached out and called me. And that's once again, is a reminder to me, man, like, man, it just, it puts me in a, a good space that like, I'm, I have been able to kind of, you know, impact some folks uh, along the road, man. And for me this month, I have to give a shout out. Jay might know her. So March 17th is uh, 20 years for me full time in this industry. Oh, wow. um, so me and Carla Hoover started in Mecklenburg County on the same day. And every time we see each other, we'd be like March 17th, 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just a phenomenal space to be in that. So that's, that's where it comes from, man. And I just think, you know, once you do that, it also helps build that network and, and it, you know, builds that comfort zone where people also know that, hey, they can give you a shout. They can talk to you about serious things that's going on in their career and their development and that you're going to be genuine. You're going to give them an opportunity to express themselves and and you're going to share, you know, and then hopefully uh, just add to the, some of that thought process. So that's where I would say, Shane. I love that. I uh, I have your next title for your next presentation. It's from Capitol Hill to Chapel Hill. There Thank you go. You. There you go. Give me that one for free. I love it. There you go. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. (laughs) Well, because you just mentioned Chapel Hill, I'm going to actually kind of roll to a different uh, area of questioning because when you did or when Tom did the introduction, he talked about you working for two large agencies and obviously working in Mecklenburg County, working in in Maryland. uh, Those are two huge agencies. What was the transition like for you going from two large agencies to Chapel Hill um, which is doing great things and obviously not too far from where I am, but obviously on a much smaller scale than what you've been really? doing for the last um, almost 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's been great. It's been phenomenal. Shout out to my team, but it, it is a difference, right? It's a difference. We talk about budget, you know, that's significant. Probably my division budget when I was in Maryland, my last role um, as the, with the youth County Wide Sports Division is probably double of what my department budget is here, right? Yeah. Um, so that component, it's also been a lane where I would say that at times, um, which I have embraced and really enjoy, like the interaction that I have here, like we're such 
not this just beyond the park and recreation department, but the town as a whole, like the other directors, the other departments, we work so closely together. You know, yeah. the planning director, you know, uh, when it comes to affordable housing, um, you know, it's just so much of a, a collaborative team. You know, our, for example, my team, um, they are my maintenance team. You know, they take care of the, of the downtown area, right? Um, and the right-of-way areas and so forth. So, for example, being in, in Chapel Hill, you know, when the Tar Heels get that big win against Duke, mm. you know, we have our emergency action team, right? And Park and Rec is at that table, right? Because if they make a decision to shut down Franklin Street, for everybody to enjoy that experience, we're at the table and having that collaboration. So being able to, you know, work with our police department, work with our fire, that's been pretty significant and really, you know, working closely with them. And I would say the other piece that has been so cool is just honestly, like, for example, I can leave my office now and I can walk down and talk to my adaptive recreation coordinator. I can talk to my uh, assistant director. I can talk to our business <laughs> management division and just being that close, right? And then also, like, when it's time to go out and check out, like, when I get done here, um, our team has a, a Foundations of Leadership uh, course that they've been facilitating. It's over at the library. I can walk to the library, right? And a lot of times when I'm out going out, checking out my facilities and, and programs, I can pretty much get around in, like, a 10 to 15-minute thing, right? Yeah. Uh, shout out to Prince George's. Love yeah. Prince George's County. Bought my first home there. Always will be uh, a fan of that. But you know how the beltway and the traffic, right? In order, I could, you know, it could be a, a two hour process to get to, you know, a certain area. Um, so that's been unique. And then just having an opportunity that you actually on a daily basis really um, get to see community members and talk to community members. And once they find out, oh, you're the director of Park and Rec. Oh, I love your program, this impact, you know, that yeah. it's having on my kids and so forth. Um, I had a meeting about, two months ago and we were talking and, and uh, a lady came in and before we got started with the meeting, she said, Oh, I saved this. She pulled out the article when I was named mm -hmm. <laughs> for the daily Tar Hill for when I was named director. So it's cool stuff like that. And I think sometimes yeah. maybe you don't necessarily get that at a, at a larger agency. So it's been cool on that. But I think also leaning in on, um, and you do this at larger agencies too, but I think here more significant of those potential partnerships and so forth. Um, and, you know, we have a great partner when it comes to UNC um, just a couple of weeks ago, our, from our Hargraves um, community center, our after school program, the kids got to go and be with the Tar Heels men's basketball team pregame on the court, national anthem in the locker room as they were celebrating. Um, so shout out to, to Coach Davis and UNC Athletics uh, for always kind of really embracing cool. and, and, and and taking them on um, and being a positive experience. I mean, like to be able to do that with one of the top teams, the team that's going to win the national championship this year, mm -hmm. like those kids are going to remember that forever, man. So um, just those great partnerships as well has been phenomenal being here. So I think that's the that's the that's the difference. Um, and some of it, like I said, even at a large age, I, I definitely have to always give a great shout out to the commission, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, because even though it was such a large agency, always still felt like family and it still feels like family, even me being yeah. here. So, yeah, I think that's interesting. A, a suburban park system. Like when I worked in the city of Fort Worth, we had our own planners, we had our own maintenance, we had our own contract. Like you could silo, you know, you could say shove off to public works you know i was never high enough to be able to do that but the director <laughs> of fort worth parks and rec could have could have almost op operated like their own city they had their own hr mm -hmm. department they had their own planners but me here in pflugerville no i have to work with planning i have to work right. with pd i have to you know you you do need those services i before tom comes in just because you've talked you've hit it a couple times now <laughs> i've never worked in a college town i mean i guess in fort worth i worked at tcu but Chapel Hill is is a true blood college town. It's one of those towns you mm -hmm. you when you think of Chapel Hill, you think of UNC. You know more than right. you think of the city. Um, right. Were you always a Tar Hill fan? Are you a Tar Hill fan by default? Or were there any Duke photos floating around that you no. had to hide or delete no. on Facebook? No Duke photos. <laughs> okay. I will. I have always been a Tar Hill fan. My brother went here for college and I have two older brothers. They're 11 and 12 years older than me. So my oldest brother went here. A lot of my good friends from gotcha. school, from high school went here. You know, I went to university of North Carolina and Greensboro. So that's the only time there you if go. they play the Tar Heels, I got to go for UNCG. But outside of that, Tar Heels all the way. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm feeling really, it was funny. Like, man, when I first moved down here, um, you know, I moved here for the assistant director role and that my first day was championship Monday the year that we didn't pull it out but that was also the weekend that we beat duke so even though we didn't win it 
it still felt good. You know what I mean? But I'm feeling good about this year, though. I'm really feeling really good about this okay, year. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now it's exciting. Big game tomorrow night, my man. This is true. This is true. Who's up? Probably Duke. They're yeah. playing Duke tomorrow. Duke. Okay. Okay. And and, yeah. and Jay's a Duke. In, in, in Cameron. In Cameron. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you, how did you guys <laughs> room together? Feel the tension. <laughs> well, Jay blocked it out, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, no, I never I, told him. I'm still thinking about that, Jay, man, that, that you don't remember. But it's blocked okay. it out completely. <laughs> So to I want to I could relate obviously with you and Shane and and working in a smaller agency and mm -hmm. I just talked to some some people last week about the topic of positioning yourself and so you know you're awesome sauce and mm -hmm. positioning yourself ultimately to position your department at the top of the food chain. Can you elaborate on that? What are some you know what are how are some or some specific examples of how you position the Parks and Rec when you are in a in a organization or a community where you're competing with the police department and all of these other departments, highway, whatever it is that are typically seen as these essential services, right? So everybody thinks Absolutely. of essential and we as parks and rec individuals, we know that we're essential. It's just very hard to convince a community, right? And mm -hmm. I, I feel like we're in a pretty good spot where I am, where, where we definitely are looked at as one of those really, you know, top providers of services in parks and rec. So mm -hmm. how are, what are ways that you've been able to, you know, utilize awesome sauce, and, and position your department so that you're looked at, number one. You know what I mean? Hey, when something is needed in that community, we're going to Parks and Rec. Absolutely. And I think a couple of elements. One is the storytelling. The storytelling is essential and making sure you create an avenue where, just like I said, a lot of times, you know, if I'm leaving the office, running to a participant or parent and they're telling that story. Right. So, um, and saying how much uh, impact that our department has been on their lives. Right. Um, so making sure one, you have those avenues where you can receive that information um, and then receive that, those data points, those talking points um, and connecting with the community and giving them a platform and empowering them to be able to share how impactful we've been on their lives. That's super, super important. I think the other component is when you have an opportunity and I see it here, the collaboration piece. So often, you know, I can talk with fire, you know, the fire chief, the fire chief is, is an advocate for parks and rec because we, we do stuff like we do training sessions, like our, our aquatic team, you know, um, does life-saving, um, you know, instruction classes when it comes to emergency management type of stuff. So at times too, you know, being very innovative when it comes to some of those budgetary asks, uh, and a lot of times it's, it's a collaborative approach. You know, we might go with fire or we might go um, with public works when we're making an ask and so forth. So I think that's another component. Um, also, I think it's very, very being very fortunate and here, um, you know, shout out to our town manager and our entire, you know, the leadership team proactively, they proactively give us an opportunity to tell those stories. And being able to have a, a audience, you know, we're in budget season now, budget, budget development season process right now. So there'll be times when we have work sessions with town council and we'll have an opportunity to come tell those stories and and tell real stories, too. We could tell the stories as it relates to the positive impact that we've been able to make, but also be able to share that if we haven't received additional funding for rises in cost of services and so forth, this is the impact that we're having on us right now and what could have in the future. Now, a lot of times what for us, we often say, you know, do we really punch above our weight? And, but sometimes, you know, the need might get lost in that, right? Cause they seeing public facing, they might not see, you know, we're making it happen. Right. But being fortunate to have leadership that gives you an opportunity to really share that authentic, authentic uh, experience and what's going on with your team so you can really advocate for them when it comes to resources and so forth um, is, is super important. And lastly, I would say the opportunity that really puts it in play is, and I, I'm going to go back, you know, I'm going to go back to just that impact. And and for me, I think being here, and this, this is going to go to all our experience like with NRPA and being involved in state associations and so forth. Like I really strive to be the most biggest champion of parks and recreation and telling those stories. Cause at the end of the day, 
people do have some they have concepts of parks and recreation, but it's the most important, you know, for me and my team to make sure that we're bringing forth and leveraging some of those best practices, trends, you know, look at what some other college towns are doing from a park and rec perspective mm. and making sure we're bringing that to the table. Um, and so that's phenomenal. And then I said that was the last thing. The other piece <laughs> is, you know, I've been very fortunate here and we're here as a department that we have some great community advocates, really champions of parks and recreation and providing them an opportunity and space and being in tune with them. So then they know, uh, kind of know what our needs are. They can, you know, advocate for us when it comes to uh, some of those budgetary resources or just also those collaborative approaches, right? Um, when we're having our Arbor Day and, you know, we have our friends of Child Hill Parks and Recreation, you know, making a significant purchase on trees and helping us promote those events or doing adopt the trail, uh, you know, program and having uh, over a hundred volunteers out there. So really leaning into those, you know, when we have our special Olympics program, you know, all the volunteers to come out and make that happen. Um, so really leaning into those um, key relationships and those positive relationships and making sure um, that we continue to foster those. I think that goes a long way too. You know, it's, it's, that's a great answer. And, you know, you nailed it. And it's important for people out there to realize too, and just to give yourself a little credit to you and your team, those relationships, those community advocates, those elected officials, whatever managers, they aren't, they're not always inherently there when you start a position, you mm -hmm. foster those relationships, you build that. And it takes, it takes time. It takes equity, as you mentioned before. So, you know, it's one of the, it, you have to work for it, but they're out Absolutely. there. It, it's, it's, it's possible. It's able to be done. Absolutely. I got a, I got a question for you, Tia, and it's something that we've had others on this podcast who have transitioned from assistant director to director, but I don't know if we've ever asked this question. And, you know, I want to peer back behind the, uh, the curtains a little bit on mindset wise, but everyone, if they're honest, you know, Jay's an assistant director now, you were an assistant director, I've been an assistant director at times, I think Tom has, has served in that role. There's something you would do differently, right? maybe one thing, maybe a hundred things, but there's something mm -hmm. you would do differently as the assistant director that, but at that, in that role, your, your support and, and your guidance and over day-to-day -day management, but sometimes you still have to defer to what the final say of the director is. Then right. you step into that director role. How quickly do you make some of those changes? Do you say, you know, this has worked for a long time. I don't want to flip up the apple cart. Or do you say, this is my department now. There's some things I saw I wanted to make some changes in, and we're going to move towards that because I think there's some people, and it's not just just agnostic to assistant director. There's people that move mm -hmm. from a coordinator to a supervisor, from a supervisor to a manager, to a superintendent, and anyone that moves up internally in a department has got to figure out a way to make that role now theirs, but maybe they've had some different ways that they would have left. So how, how, do you, how, do you, how did you do that? Yeah, absolutely. And it was very unique. So, you know, I started April uh, 2022 and then the basically October, November, I was named interim. Um, our previous director had another opportunity to go to Greensboro and his director there. Shout out to Phil. Um, great, phenomenal park and recreation professional. Also so, another Mecklenburg County alum. There you go. 100 percent. 100 percent. So it was very uh it was unique because it was, this, you know, I'm really just kind of getting my graphs here, you know, in a, in a six month period. And then also, you know, we had a transition from a town manager standpoint where we had an interim town manager. Right. And then he went on to become the, the town manager as well. Um, so I think it's a balance because there's some things and being in that role. And I think it also is a credit to my predecessor because we were so at the table has so many great discussions, even as him being the director, we were we were co-pilot on this thing um, and he really valued my opinion. So there were some things I think that at the time we were already kind of transitioning in and putting in play that maybe was a little different than from his thought process on some things. Um, and then also being at the table with our key lead, our management team and knowing, hey, there are some things that they're on board to maybe let's make some transition. Um, I would say for me, it was fairly quick, like, um, I think we, I might, I might not even say the topic, but, you know, there's a, there's a sports trend going on out here right now when it comes to utilizing a court, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, different lines and so forth. So we had some tough discussions, right. Um, and probably about a month into my being the director um, with the support of the department and town leadership, we, we made some, some different moves that probably wasn't necessarily in, in, in works at the time. Right. Yeah. 
I think it's just a balance of, of being able to know that you do have to, there's going to be times you're going to have to make those decisions and so forth. And it definitely feels good when you do have the support uh, at the end of the day, Hey, they see you as the professional, they see you as the leader of the organization. And some of those things you're going to have to, you know, jump out there, say, yes, take that step of doing. And some of it too is, you know, there's still things now, even from an assistant director role that I wanted to kind of hopefully be able to put in play and they might not be in play just yet. And some things, you know, it's a problem. It's, you've got that time, I man. You got that football feel, right? Yeah. And some things mm-hmm. you, you know, you might be inside the, the red zone. Others you're sure. a little bit farther away. But still, I think the main thing is also, and it kind of comes back to that transparency piece, just making sure your team kind of knows that thought process and, hey, what are we working towards? And what are some things that, that are significant and important? You know, I always share with my team, professional development is super important to me. Like that's something that is always going to be top notch. Um, even some things I learned from, you know, predecessors and other agencies, you know, cosmetic things like when you come into a facility, those things are always going to be super important to me. So it's important to me as a leader, put that out. Don't have no, don't hide that. Right. These sure. are priorities that we got to put in play and make and, happen. And there's clarity at the top. Sometimes the view mm-hmm. from the top changes things a little bit and you realize there you maybe the previous director didn't do something because of what you're yeah. now aware that they didn't do or it wasn't right. it wasn't palatable or whatever and so i think not to say any anyone internally from a department from the cheap seats but i do think the view changes from time to time when you're Absolutely. when you're at the top as well and sometimes you also couldn't palate or stomach maybe that change initially so yeah i i think the perspectives in in promotion are very interesting well, it's, it goes Absolutely. back to that flexibility piece too. You you get that different view from the top. You had a you had this mindset going into that position that it has to be this way, and then you mm-hmm. learn why someone does it the way that they do it. And mm-hmm. it may not be your exact way, but sometimes A to Z, what's in the middle doesn't matter. You just got to get to there the finish go. line. There you go. Absolutely. Sometimes it does matter though. Yeah, sure. Right, right, right. And I think you know to that point, Tom. Also, I think our experiences and if you have been at different agencies, that's something that you learn too. like, you know, you might have been in one agency where when you're making a decision, you have to go through so many layers and you might be here where it's like, hey, let's rock. We support you. Let's do it. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so sometimes if you if you've been in those lanes before as a leader, at times it might take you some time to get, okay, I can do this. Like I can make it happen. Let's go. (laughs) Well, I think also from like the leadership perspective of what you just said, if your predecessor before you didn't allow some people to make decisions or to go in that path, and then you want that, it can be a big learning curve for the staff too to understand like, oh, cool, like Atuya is okay with us doing this. I don't need to follow like 18 different steps like I had to before and and not using that as the example, but it's Mm -hmm. just, you know, trying to gauge with the team when you get to that ability to make decisions and understanding like why it was done in the past the way it was and maybe you can change that and then allow your staff to feel more empowered yeah absolutely jay and i and i think to use that example too and something i learned even you know when i was in maryland and even here like so much i know how, how y'all do the same way i love going out to our programs i love going i love to get the invite sometimes i joke on my team like y'all don't invite me man i feel a little you know because i always tell people you know the emails are going to pile up you know, the calls are going to, but I'm never going to sacrifice like not going out to support my team and being there and seeing things. But the reality is when I sometimes do that and early on in the game, sometimes team members have, you know, not so positive experiences when directors or assistant directors came out to see things. Cause you know, somebody told me like, you know, sometimes as soon as they come out, then 10 minutes later, I'm getting an email after they leave of what, wasn't right you know what i mean so um i kind of had to start learning that and digesting that to make sure you know and it's a learning experience right as your team learns you and they're like nah until you when a two year comes i'm coming to have fun i'm coming to pitch in help out i'm coming to get my selfie you know our ussy picture you know to be able to share but definitely I, I think that that change in experiences and knowing that our team members have you know especially you know you have team members that have been 10 15 20 years they've seen several different leadership ways and, and, and approaches. So, you know, those things are real. And I think we have to take that into account. And as a leader, don't take it personal, you know, um, just, just, you know, realize that it's, it's genuine. And, and I think the main piece is as people get to know you and to see your genuine approach, uh, I think they'll, they'll support that. Yeah. 
you mentioned a few minutes ago about professional development, and that's obviously like the root of a lot of things that we've done. And that's what brought all of us together many years ago and kind of kept us so connected because we had a desire to be involved professionally and grow and go through YPN and go through different NRPA committees and groups. When you're leading your team, you know, what has been a, a grinding point of like making sure they stay involved professionally or, you know, have you had staff that maybe didn't see that as a value and, and how do you turn that into an opportunity to teach them like the benefits of it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I've been fortunate here. We've had um, several team members and even new team members that have came on in the last year or two and they've had that involvement already. So I'm being really excited to be able to just continue to foster that. I think the one piece that comes into, especially when you start thinking about even some of those national conferences and those things that are a little bit more expensive, like as a leader, I'm, I'm, I've been really thinking what our team is just the creative way of how we can on a budgetary side, be able to make sure we're supporting those opportunities. Right. You know, when you're at an agency, you know, like the, the commission, you know, they're sending hundreds of people, right. <laughs> At Chapel Hill at times, you know, and when I'm going to like last year, I think we had three people. Right. So just trying to be creative when it comes to that. I think also is this as a leader, this setting the tone and sharing stuff like I just shared uh, the sports commission in Durham is having a, a women's leadership summit. So just the point of me, hey, this came over from our friends from Durham. Y'all should check it out. Anybody interested, please let me know. We would love to, you know, to have representation to go over there. So just doing those small steps, I think, goes a long way. And then I think having that platform and ingraining it into your day to day. So like when we have our supervisors team meeting with our management team, you know, I'm often bringing stuff or leveraging or other other team members or leaders in our organization are bringing stuff from the North Carolina State Association or bringing stuff from NRPA to the table and saying, hey, did you check this out? Um, they got this fellowship, you know, they got this contest with the picture counts out. I think my team might be tired of me sending emails about that because I'm like, mm -hmm. I want to put a picture in for the picture contest this year, right? Um, one of my team members, she just like reached out uh, recently because she's going to apply for one of the fellowships. And I'm like, right. yes, I'm so excited about that. So I think the part, especially for us, I think we got to share our story, right? Yeah. And share what the impact it had, you know, that us getting into these opportunities, getting involved with associations and professional development opportunities have had on us and just kind of telling that story. And I think it really energizes our team members too. And especially when you talk about, you know, at the screen, we all got different personalities. So when I can share that, Hey, I'm naturally an introvert, but I apply for this fellowship and I was able to network and build and I could tell the story about, you know, how I found out about the Maryland opportunity was my mentor, you know, through an NRPA fellowship was Tom Ross, who was executive director of the Maryland recreational park association at the time. So boom, this how that impacted my career, right? Or me being able to serve on the program committee to rock out with people like Shane Dietrich, you know what I mean? Rosalind Johnson, um, Tiffany Johnson, you know, those type of stories, like, you know, being able to share that and just they can say, okay, wow, man, like this is, this actually could, could, could work a little bit here. You know what I mean? So I think that component too, but also just, as you mentioned earlier, I think this really setting the tone and making sure that's a core priority. So yeah. when we have like our business plan conversations and stuff, the development and and I'm so very thankful for here in the town of Chapel Hill, you know, even like, you know, I, this past October was a poor appreciation month. And just the thing that we did on a whole grand scale of making sure that our team members know how much we appreciate them. And a part of that appreciation is what we do to hopefully, you know, invest into our team members from a professional development standpoint, you know, and putting resources behind it. That's great stuff too. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I could echo everything you say. I love how you talked about sharing your story. You know, that's, that's sometimes mm -hmm. hard for people to do. You don't want to sound as if you're boasting or bragging, but it's important for right. people to hear, make them feel like it's attainable. You know, everything is, everything's achievable for people. So, Hey, I think we're gonna we're gonna shift over and learn a little bit about it to you right now to Let's wrap up it. the show. All Let's right. So it. we want our listeners to hear a little bit more about you. We call this rapid fire or quick hitters. We don't really have specific names for these <laughs> yet. So we're not pros, but there we go. I'm gonna start it off. We're just gonna ask you a couple quick questions. They're quick answers. We're gonna round the horn a few times. Favorite non Carolina Panther UNC sports team. Mm. Mm. Let's go Washington Capitals. Oh, all right. All right. Alex Ovechkin. There we okay. go. There we uh, go. 
what is a speaker that when you see their name at conference, you move things around to make sure you get to thin their session? Oh, Lakita Fraser. Hmm. Okay, well, hey, I'm going to keep it on that same topic. Tom and I are actually going to the Maryland State Conference next month. So who from Thanks a, for the invite. From, <laughs> who <laughs> in the state of Maryland that may not present at national that we should look out for if their name is on the docket for presenting? Mm, who from the state of Maryland? Oh, man, I, I wanted to say, but she's just below the – how, oh, man, I want to say J. Cole, but VA J. Cole, now, right? She, she's going to yeah. be there. J. Cole is presenting. Oh. Okay. J. Cole, good. definitely yep. J. Cole. You know she used to yep. be in Maryland. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So J. Cole and I are we're still on uh the CPC together. And I know nice. she's going because we were hanging out with Courtney from Maryland at the winter meeting a couple weeks ago. So I know J. Cole will be there. And she is a great speaker. Absolutely. Absolutely. Enjoy the food too. All Looking right. To enjoy the food. <laughs> I guess that changes my next question. <laughs> what, what food what food am, we, um, am i supposed to target while we're in maryland and i've been there a few times but give me something oh definitely crab cakes and the, and you know the uh crabs but also if you venture down it's it's unique in maryland right you're right there geographically dc baltimore prince george's but when it comes to the mambo sauce and we talk about awesome sauce the mambo sauce that goes on the chicken wings and the fries you probably got to dip down to Prince George's and D.C. to get that. That's not necessarily. And here I'm a, a Carolina guy trying to tell the DMV folks, <laughs> but I don't know. That's kind of what I picked up on. Like, that's not really be more Baltimore style, but, you know, but definitely if you can, can venture down and get that. But definitely from the, the crab um, and I would say mambo sauce on chicken wings and the fries. It's a must. Answer I'm two great. of my questions. I was going for the the next question was sauce. I'm just going <laughs> to stick with that mambo sauce. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm pretty sure someone mentioned mambo sauce on a previous episode, but I don't recall. I feel like that's true, but I don't recall either. I mean, Ros was, was it, was it, it Roslyn? It might have been Roslyn. Probably Maybe. could have been Roslyn. Um, a okay. book recommendation. Do you have a good book re recommendation? So a couple weeks ago, I was in a, uh, a training. So I would say Smart Leaders, Smart Teams, Roger Shorts. And he actually resides in Chapel Hill and he actually uh, was a part of the, the training. And so we had a book um, that we prepared for that. Great book. Great book. You mentioned earlier uh, mentors and people that have helped you get to where you are. Who are, you know, one or two of your, your favorite mentors that you still reach out to on a regular basis in our park and rec world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely got to give a shout out to Steve Carter and with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. So Steve Carter, I would also say Azivia Little. She was on my first ever interview panel when I became from Mecklenburg County. Um, so her and then, man, I know you said more mentors, but these folks, I would say, started out as my mentees. But when I get to rock with them and talk with them, so Coyote Lewis, mm. uh, Pat Young, um, who helped start the Recreation Lacrosse Program in Prince George's County. And then my man, Cody, who's up in Philly, and, and me and Cody got to connect. We've been playing phone tag a little bit, but I actually was connected through him. He was a student um, and somebody from, you know, from the YPN back in the day connected me to him because he likes a little fashion like I like the fashion as well. Um, so, yeah, not only the mentors, but also hey, the Odie. mentors who have become mentors. Coyote, hey, that name was a yeah. was a trigger, man. What a great <laughs> a great dude. Uh, he went to Nursa, right? He went to the sports and yeah. real sports side up in New Hampshire. Yeah, campus right side of there. Yep, yep, yeah. absolutely. What a good another guy. another YPN name for sure. That that guy yeah. always had a smile on his face. The happiest was just dude. A, a joy to talk 100%. to. Well, 100%. maybe Jay can call him and replace you with him. <laughs> <laughs> <That's really laughs> <happy. laughs> well, let me ask you, then, just for clarity, did you have it on your calendar next week too, or did you just no. cancel that one and <laughs> say, "Hey, I'm I'm going with Tom." He played the game. Yeah, I played the game, man. I felt, I really felt so bad. You know, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't send you my resume. I was like, man, if I do that, that's really like that's great. Just going overboard. Well, yeah. see, what's funny is I had a note to reach back out to you over the like this coming week <laughs> to say I need your resume so I can do a little bio. Don't play, don't I hate don't. the player, hate the game. That's what this is, baby. That's great. Yeah. Well played. Yeah, that this is, is the second time on Reckless History that this has happened. Yeah, so it is, it is. It Beanstein, happened to me. Happened Michael to me. Beanstein put you off a long way. I love that Jay's yeah. got one week to scramble. This right. is great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, this was a great time. I had a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you for joining us. 
It was great to see 100%, you. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I appreciate y'all, and I'll echo what I said earlier. It's always a pleasure, and it's just a rejuvenation point, man. When we have an opportunity to see y'all, and um, much continued success. Keep pouring on y'all awesome sauce, because uh, y'all definitely have made an impact on my professional career. And consider y'all friends, man, and keep rocking this reckless thing, man. One hundred percent. Appreciate y'all. Same. And when y'all come to Chapel Hill, look me up. And just know we're about to win this championship. Oh, so there I'm we excited go. about it. Jay's got to wear he's got to wear a UNC shirt or jersey after this win, right? Yeah, we can make, we need to make that happen. We need oh, to make that happen. Great. Thank I'll you all so much. Saturday night. We'll all see right. how it goes. Thanks, Atiria. All right. Y'all take, take, care. take care. All right. Thanks, Atiria. That was awesome. A lot of fun. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, man, he was my guest next week. That is yeah, well, so yeah. great. That I feel has so never good. happened that way. I feel so good about snaking, snaking you, Jay. Did you know, Tom? No, I, he didn't tell me. Oh, that's right. Well, it's funny that he didn't tell you because, like, yeah. Beanstein told me. Tom reached out to me, and I was like, "Cool, put him off." But Tom Beanstein did. He put you like in December, in the middle of yeah. October. So you had yeah, some time I got to some time. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a lot of fun in general, and you know, I I want to feel bad for just saying Jay's name wrong, and now I feel bad for taking his guess too. This has just been a rough, a rough. I'm enjoying both today. of those actually. <laughs> that you said his name wrong. <laughs> He's it's okay. Man. Next time, maybe you'll be Shane Mizzy. And that's right. Shane <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Uh, all right, guys. I really appreciate you, uh, as always, making the time for, for something that I really enjoy. We will see you two next time. Hopefully, I don't know. We'll see what Jay pulls out of his hat, right? But <laughs> may, maybe we'll You're going to have to cancel that calendar invite, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just sent you a, a, a yeah. screenshot that says meeting, meeting with the with two of you. That's yeah. so great. You need the hold that Shane sends so that I have the Zoom link going to him that we don't share the same link. So you don't, he doesn't see the meeting invite. You should have a two you hop on next week, but go by Batuya or. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's a, here would be an interesting twist. If this ever happens again, we should put it on the guest to find the guest for next week. Oh. Ooh. So you should call up Batuya sometime after this. Put him on the hook. Say yo. Not his fault, but that's funny. It's great, man. That that's really funny. That's why. So as soon as you started leading with the bio, your face was like the mouth was that open. <laughs> now I get I it. I knew right away because I knew about his father. Yep. And obviously, like you said, YPN, there's history, and you mentioned his dad. And I'm like, I know who this is. And I saw when I saw Optimistic Sports fan. I see him every year he comes to a Panthers game and we tried to tailgate or like, I, I don't typically go to the game, but I'll meet up with him in the parking lot and just, you know, catch up. And, um, you know, he's always positive about the Panthers, even though they're, they don't have a very bright future at the moment. <laughs> but uh, I was like putting two and two together. I'm like, you know what? It's a two. Yeah. And that's my man next week. So funny, man. And that's Great. weird. I was in Buffalo at the same time Jay was in Buffalo at a game and he didn't even bother didn't to call, make, a, didn't call, make no, a trip he... to see me in the parking lot. No. Hey, um, you <laughs> know what? It goes both ways, brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. I get it. It was a big game. I wanted to respect your your fandom. All right. I was just a guest in the Bills house. <laughs> hey, it was a great time. I will look forward to seeing you guys next time. And everybody, we will see you next week, hopefully, on Reckless. See ya. Take care.